Thank you for coming along for our series, Hug Out Hate. Today, we're going to meet Yako Darling Khan. I learned about this gentleman from a book that my brother sent me called Jaguar in the Body, Butterfly in the Heart. And I love the juxtaposition to using animals and our bodies and war animals. And this gentleman really explores the subconscious and the dream life. And he's a shaman who has found himself doing really wonderful work uh, to address deep generational connections to the U.S. and England and individual couples and their relationships together. But I was able to lock him down to meet up with me and we took a car from London and took a boat to another place and ended up in a car driving on this tiny road to the end of a point in England called Devon where he has horses and this land where he holds his workshops for healing and that's where you'll find us. Let's go for a walk. Beautiful autumn day in Devon. Nice and quiet as always. So, uh, you know, for, for years we had a, a dream of living on a hill in an eco property, a place that um, really fitted our ideals of life. And, you know, we only came to see this as a, a kind of a whimsical, like, what would it look like? But we fell so in love with this place. You can probably see why. We spent a lot of time working with this little lake. It was, uh, it was full of weed when we got here, like just packed full of weed. So this is one of my uh, favorite places on the property. I'll sometimes come here in the morning, bring my drum out, sit by the water. It's a beautiful spot. I love these old oak trees. Wow, the colors this time of year, something really exceptional. These old oak trees, they're just, um, they're so steady. You can really, when I sit here, I can really feel that solid ground underneath my feet and that protection of those branches. In our work, we, we work a lot with the symbol of the tree of life and uh, to live now in a property where there's so many old, old trees. Some of these trees are like three, 400 years old. Puts our own lives in perspective, huh? So I like to come here and play my drum, take a moment at the beginning of the day just to say thank you. Thank you for this body, thank you for the breath. Thank you that uh, I have another day to love and live and learn on this earth. And drumming is the, it's like the, it's the oldest shamanic tool the drums, the rhythm of the drum, the beat of the drum. It entrains the heart. It helps us to really settle down, settle in, to focus, actually. So I'm just going to take a little time. drum made from and I kind of looked at it and I said well yeah it's made of wood and a tree and the skin of a this particular skin was a the drum that he gave me was a reindeer skin and he said yeah that's right what does that mean to you and I thought about it and I said you know I, I'm sorry to say I've never really thought about it I don't know he said I thought not by the way you're banging that drum he said, you have to go and hunt. You have to know what it means to, to have a skin, to have a drum, to, um, to play your drum. You have to know that whole process. So uh, at the time I was a vegan, so I was <laughs> not too happy about the, the whole situation. But he taught me, he taught me and I'm going hunting and 
choosing to take the life of a, a beautiful animal like a deer and then to, to learn to skin it, to, to take its body, to eat, to make a drum from its skin. That whole process, it, it genuinely broke my heart, as I think it should. But it really made me think about the whole thing about how we eat, how, we, how we're aware, you know. My shoes are made from leather, this beater's made from leather. What it means to wear the skin of an animal, or to play the skin of an animal. So you're a dreamer? Yeah, I'm a dreamer. I kind of dreamed this place, so you know, 20 years ago, my wife Susanna and I, we sat down and we thought about, you know, the perfect place to live. A place on, uh, on a hill, lots of wood and glass. What are our dream characters? Are they there to talk to us, to tell us things? Absolutely, I mean, our dreams, I, I once, I recently heard somebody talking that they said, uh, you know, really? If you, if you recognize the wisdom that's in your dream every night, you'd get down on your knees and you'd sit in front of them and ask your dreams to teach you. And dream characters, like there's many ways of looking at dreams. One of the, one of the most important, I think, or the most helpful is to see everything in the dream as a, a symbol of what's going on within our own psyches. So they're all characters that are often hidden parts because it, what's amazing when we go to sleep is that our left brain falls asleep. Our left brain is, this is a big generalization, it's more complex than this, but a generalization you might say the left brain is the part of us that uses language, numbers, um, is very rational, understands the rational material world. Very important, very helpful. But it falls asleep. And then our right brain, which is typically described as more creative, more open, more connected to the unconscious. It's like the roots of these trees. Like the roots of these trees, you can't see them, but they are what gives the tree life. They rise up from the unseen parts of ourselves, the unconscious, the roots. So when someone's struggling with something, like I've heard people that they almost wake up from nightmares thinking that one of the girls that I'm interviewing talked about that she's been dwelling on revenge, you know, and, and she'll lay awake at night, fall asleep, wake up from something. And, uh, you know, are, are, we, are we trying to process how we should deal with it? Is, it? is it sometimes not how we should deal with it? Well, how do you <coughs> learn to hear what it's saying? Basically, the, the unconscious will show us what we're not allowing in our day-to-day -day life. So, um, you know, for instance, you know, if we're talking about somebody who's dwelling on revenge, um, the, the emotion that's behind that might well appear in their dream and in a way that's being acted out. It certainly doesn't mean that when you wake up, you should then go and do that. It's more your psyche is giving you a, a movie. It's showing you look, this is what's going on inside you. This is the effect it's having, you know. If I'm hating somebody, um, that's, in a way, it's creating more disease and difficulty within me than it is in, in the person I'm hating. It's, it's damaging me unless I act out on it, unless I then take action um, to act out on that hate. It's damaging me, it's, you know, it's creating acidity in the blood, it's, it's keeping me um, really locked into what, what happened in the past. And, you know, I, I feel for somebody who's in that place. It's not, it's not, I'm not saying, you know, not sitting from on high saying you should not. I, I get it, I understand it. It's just that it's, it's inflicting damage on ourselves. And so in the dream state, you may well find yourself being violent. You may well find yourself expressing fury or grief, um, but it's likely that the dream will, will show you parts of the psyche that are not available to you in your waking life, or that you're just not aware of. 
so it's you know the dream world is as rich like the possibilities of meaning in our dreams are as rich as the possibility of meaning in our day-to-day -day life and for me the key is that actually what meaning we make from the symbols that we see in our dreams or um, even the the meaning we make of what's happening in our day-to-day -day life that's where we have choice it's where we have choice it's where we have power it's where we have i would say responsibility to use that power um, but if if we've not been taught how to deal with the the terrible things that can happen to us as human beings if we don't have the resources, the tools, the knowledge of how to process that. Um, we, you know, we're left alone with it and, you know, we can make ourselves sick on all levels with that. And, you know, so shamanically speaking, um, when somebody has that suffering inside them, we have to go back to the root of that suffering and we have to um, give time and space for mostly the the emotion that's locked in you know I, we've been talking about hatred hatred is like frozen feeling it's it's like holding on to something that happened like a freeze frame like an isolated image and rerunning it again and again and again like a scene just round and round and round and we're holding ourselves in in a dream and you know, it, you know, we do that when we're asleep and we do it when we're awake as well. Um, and it's to do with, again, uh, we're not taught how to deal with the basics of our emotional language, our emotional intelligence. We're mammals. We share the same feelings with all, anim with all mammals. And, you know, so fear anger, sadness, joy, compassion, these emotions that are common to all mammals. If we don't, if we're not taught in school, you know, in a, as young children, um, it, but it's one, it's natural to have these feelings, and two, what you can do with them, we're gonna have a lot of trouble in our, in our life when the challenges of life, and you know, I know you're talking and dealing with some really severe challenges, somebody's you know, had a family member who's, who's been murdered or, you know, like, this is severe. This is not like you're just everyday challenge of, you know, I'm not feeling so good today. If we don't have the, the knowledge in us how to deal with that or the, and the community around us that, that has that knowledge, we're left on our own. And isn't that a big part of it? The, uh, the parenting or the community that seems to be the way it was created to be where we're passing down this information and and the elders pass it to the children who pass it to the children yeah. it seems that we should be getting better at this by more of, of this occurring because someone knew before us how does it get broken why does it split away to where a bunch of people don't get those lessons? I mean, that's a, it's a deep question because, you know, in fact, um, as a species, we are getting better. Like, globally, you know, there's less deaths through violence on this planet than at any other time in human history. And there's seven billion of us. You know, it's, we have evolved yeah. a lot. However, there is so much in our collective history like you take uh, you know I talk about my own people the Jewish people and you took look at the situation in Israel and Palestine um, there's so when I go to Israel and Palestine and I work there with Israelis and Palestinians together people who are willing to talk to each other to to um, you know, there's amazing things going on there there's a group called parents for peace these are parents who've lost children who have to the other side by snipers or suicide bombers. They have every reason to hate. And they've chosen to meet with these others and see them as human beings and see the common grief 
we've lost children. And, and their joint statement is, no more bloodshed in the name of our kids. That's incredible, like what strength that takes. Um, but generally speaking, there's been some amazing research, like the difference between a Hitler character and a, you know, a Michelangelo, both who had extremely traumatic childhoods. And um, the, only, the research I saw about that said that in the case of Michelangelo, there was one person who saw them and who was able to acknowledge them and love them. They couldn't save them from their experiences, but, but they were present in their life. And that one person, that one presence, made the difference. So, yes, I think, you know, we never know the effect of our actions, but definitely um, a little bit of love can make all the difference. But it, it's so complex because, again, it depends on the culture, the community. The, there's so much transgenerational trauma that we're just beginning to become aware of. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm working a lot with a guy um, in the States at the moment who, who's teaching me about the transgenerational trauma of 243 years of chattel slavery in, in the States, which of course, you know, a lot of the wealth of England came from the, the trade of slavery. Um, that, that things like that, like massive suffering, that has not been acknowledged, where there's been, you know, there weren't therapists and counselors and community centers. It was just like, okay, well, we had 243 years of some of the worst kind of human suffering, let's just get on with it. But that suffering unacknowledged gets passed through the generations. And then the kind of behavior that we see in, in, in troubled communities all around the world you can actually see it as the results of it's acting out trauma and we're just beginning to understand now this when trauma is not acknowledged when stories don't get to be told if you can't tell me hey this happened to me and i don't kind of say oh well you know you should be over that that was 200 years ago get over it man you know why do you keep going on about that it's it's a, such a lack of understanding of what we carry as human beings and and you know shamanically speaking acknowledging what we carry the suffering is actually the way that we we find our empowerment we find the power to make different choices when we kind of go yeah i acknowledge the suffering of my people i acknowledge the suffering that then was passed on in my own family i acknowledge that that wisdom that we would hope would be there from our elders was broken because there wasn't that support for those stories to be told and listened to. What did England do? And, and what, what could be, yeah, linked to, to healing in that space? Well, you know, England built an empire. Uh, you know, that, there was, that was, they were very proud, the, the British, in the t days of the empire, that the sun never sets, sets on the British Empire. It's everywhere. And tiny little island like Britain, based on, like this, on the one hand, like adventurous spirit to go out and explore. Amazing, beautiful, wonderful. But backed up by a story that um, the color of our skin, our island, our nobility, our... We're the civilized ones. You know the story of um, when Gandhi came to England and uh, he was interviewed and they said, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of civilization? And he looked at them and he said, I think it would be a really good idea. And, um, you know, poof, straight in there. The, the, the British, backed up by a pseudoscience of white supremacy, of like, because the color of my skin, I am somehow more advanced, more civilized, more intelligent. These were stories backed up by, you know, a fledgling idea, but it, it gave this empire, this colonial spirit, um, a, a, a feeling that they could just walk into somebody's home and take what they wanted, claim it as their own, treat the people as less than human. I mean, in our, if you want to look at the effects of the British Empire, and, you know, these trees, this is Dartmoor, the, 
Dartmoor used to be a beautiful wild oak forest. It's now bare ground. The reason is because the, the empire built ships. They built ships for one tree. They, for one uh, ship to travel, they took 3,000 oak trees and cleared the forest. This is, and of course, you know, then, then in order to, to fund that, they, they took all the resources from those countries. They took the people. They brought them here. They, they, there was a whole slavery trade, you know. And then, you know, they discovered sugar and the, the wealthy people in Europe wanted sugar. So then you had all the, the um, sugar plantations which sprung up, which needed slaves um, to run them because, you know, I'm not going to work on a sugar plantation. Well, I, and so they, they brought in all these people to feed the sugar habits of the, Euro the wealthy Europeans. It's everything is linked when you look at any story of suffering and difficulty it's all linked together so you what's know? the work you brought up a man that you're working with on a project well i i've been studying this because hey i i am a white guy i'm a white jewish guy and i'm um i i want to know what happened i want to understand he he's um he's my diversity coach he's teaching me about um things that I may be unconscious of. We're all unconscious of a, lot, a whole lot of things. I want to know. I want to know. Um, you know, we work all over the world, but even when I went to South Africa, I was like, you know, I'm going to South Africa to work. I went in the room to teach a group of people. It was mostly white. I was like, what's going on, guys? So I, you know, I have to take some responsibility for the language I'm using, for the descriptions of our work. I want to learn how to to speak to more people. So that, that means me taking responsibility for learning. How can I make a, a space more welcoming, more inclusive, more... So I, I'm doing that work because I think it's... I think we all need to do that work. Uh, whatever the color of our skin, whatever our culture, we need to learn about the other and be willing to... Um... And do you think that uh, doing that work, especially with the what happened in America, at least the talking about it, can bring healing from hate between uh, anyone that was hurt by that? Well, I think it's not just talking. I think we need to be willing to be with each other's pain. Whatever side of any story we're talking about, we need to be willing to listen and to hear and to feel and not kind of go, oh, let me make that better for you, but um, let me just be with you while you're telling me like what your experience has been as a, you know, a, a white Jewish guy going to a school where there was two other Jews, as a, a young black guy growing up in New York and being stopped by the police far more often because of the color of your skin or treated in a particular way. Like we need, we just need to hear each other's experience, which includes being willing to be with the emotion of that. Because without that, you know, I can't, it's not enough just to say, okay, tell me your story. Okay, I've listened to your story. Yeah. I, I want to, I need to feel it. I need to be willing to kind of go, wow, man. Wow, you're, you're, we're, we're working with guys now. Um, I'm um, thinking of one particular man who, who'd be happy if I talked about him. His name's Tony. He's um, been a heroin addict most of his life. Uh, he's a, a black Jamaican Arawak, his people are. His people came over here um, to work and, you know, he, he, he had a very violent childhood. As he's grown up and started his own healing process, he met the work that we were doing when he was in prison. Somebody, one of the people we trained, took it to prison. He met it there and he was like, wow, you know, this is a place I can actually um, start to feel free. He, he told me that for the first time in his life, he felt free and he was in prison. Um, he, you know, he's telling me that he understands that the violence that his father did to him. His father whipped him. And when he learned that his great-grandfather was whipped every day on the boats coming over as a slave and then was whipped in working on the plantations 
uh, you know, he, un he kind of understood, it's like, you know, this just became normal in my culture. This was just an e expression, you know, somebody's bugging me, I whip them. And so he was able to see his own father in a different light, but he had to express the feelings in him first in order to feel compassion. He had to, he had to, had to find a safe space where he could feel the fury of that child. That's the key, because there's different kinds of hatred, but the kind of hatred that we feel as adults, as a result of what happened to us as children, through the hand of people who had more power than us, it could be parents, could be a teacher, could be anybody who had more power than us. That's a particular kind of hatred um, that can be healed, and needs a, it needs space to be felt. You know, you need to dance that out of your system. You need to let the wind blow through your system. You need to cry those tears. But if you, if you can, if you can find the safe space like my, my friend Tony is doing in our work, he's able to make different choices in his life now with his children because he's found a space where he can understand his father, heal the feelings inside him, and not have to pass it on to his children. This is our sweat lodge site. Um, and um, recently, our son was uh, given permission to run these ceremonies, which are basically, it's like an outdoor sauna. Um, you cover this with blankets, light a fire, and there are, here's the pile of stones here. You heat the stones up in the fire, bring them in, pour water on, you sweat, and meanwhile you sit on the ground and make your prayers. And it's uh, actually this ceremony, the sweat lodge ceremony, um, you can find it in a lot of different cultures, not just Native American cultures, but also the Sami people of North, Northern Europe, um, the Irish Old Celtic cultures had a, a form of sweat, sweating, a ceremonial or, or prayerful sweating, and, uh, which is about both physical and spiritual purification. God, there's so much as we're talking. It's like, I realize how much hatred ha plays such a role in our work. I was just saying, we know a guy who, who works with soldiers who have PTSD, like post-traumatic stress disorder, and he uses the, the sweat lodge as a a form of both physical, uh, mental, emotional, and spiritual purification. I know in some traditions, when the warriors came back from battle, they'd go straight into a sweat lodge to purify from the, you know, the traumas that they'd experienced or witnessed. I've um, heard that uh, yeah. soldiers also sometimes have experienced um, self-hate for the things that they've done, you know, and, and they yeah. can't forgive themselves yeah. to the point of suicide because they, they, they hate that they couldn't control what happened or why yeah. they did. It's it, interesting. It's amazing how many of the homeless people you'll find on the streets of the major cities of the world are ex-soldiers who've just, you know, come back and not been able to, they've not been given the support. That, you know, somebody who's served their country, regardless of what you think of war, you know, they've, at least to, to the best of their ability, they've gone out and done what they thought was the right thing to do and not been really welcomed back and, and given a healing space. I'm so pleased you mentioned self-hatred because, you know, I think that's a major thing that um, we suffer from in the industrial world. It's a, a lack of self-acceptance, a lack of self-knowledge, uh, a lack of capacity to deal with um, the, the the traumas of our lives, or just even the everyday challenges. And um, what, what does sweating have to do with it? Well, you know? basically, you know, if you for someone that has it, no idea sure, what you're talking about, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you imagine this covered in blankets and waterproof, completely dark inside, you've got stones inside. You're, it's very hot. We're playing the drum and we're singing. Um, you're, 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 so you're physically sweating, you're dealing with the heat, it changes your state. So you're less in the kind of rational world and you, you get more in touch with the physical, uh, emotional 
response and you can feel more what's actually going on in the body, in the heart and focus the mind on healing, you, you, you're not just opening the pores of your skin, you're opening the pores of your heart so that um, whatever might be locked in has a chance to be felt and released and sang or wept or even shouted uh, out. Did that ever happen for you personally? Oh like, man, many times. Did you have a first experience that said, man, I want to do this more, this brought me healing? Yeah, I mean, the, the very first sweat I went in, it was so hot in there and I was like, it was, it was almost impossible to, to stay conscious because it was so hot and so strong and the sound of the drums and the, you know, the, the, the singing and I just, what happened for me was I, I kind of, my heart broke open because I felt that often when people are doing these ceremonies, they describe this space as like going back into the womb, not your mother's womb, but our mother's womb, the earth's womb. It's like a holding, nurturing place. And I felt like for the first time I was, my body, my feelings, my thoughts were being literally supported by gravity but I didn't I felt this earth as a loving presence and I just I wept I just I wept <laughs> just for God knows an hour uncontrollably and um, I felt the pain of not just my loss but our culture's loss of that knowledge of this earth as a as a living being that that that's holding us all day long, every day. You know, we're not, we don't live an embodied existence. We don't live in touch with our physicality. I'm talking culturally, I'm talking about the industrial culture that's, you know, brought us all up into the mind, like very far up and a little bit to the left. So we're kind of <laughs> walking around. I, I heard Sir Ken Robinson, who's an educator, describing, he said, you know, for most of us, our bodies are just vehicles to take our heads from one meeting to the next. And I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, and that's deadly. It's deadly for our health. It's deadly for our empowerment. It's deadly for our creativity. It's deadly for our possibility to love and it's deadly for our possibility to heal. So you, we, we have to, you know, someone might look and go, well, you, you want me to take my clothes off and sit on the ground and sweat like why would I do such a crazy thing you know in order to heal sometimes you have to do crazy things you have to put yourself out of your normal everyday experience you know indigenous people around the world have done this forever it's called initiation and when we don't initiate our young people and you want to know the effects of that just turn on the news tonight that's the effect of an uninitiated a bunch of uninitiated yeah. people running around. I think around. you can gauge how far away someone is by, by seeing how strange that they think this would be, you know? Yeah. If you think that's yeah. so crazy, you, you, yeah. you, we can tell how far away yeah. from the I, earth that you are. And I understand, you know, it's like if you've had and no connection a, with this, you yeah. had, you've had no connection with something like you know what the earth is alive or you know my my body is intelligent or um you need to have your feet touching ground yeah it's dirty <laughs> yeah i mean no man yeah this is dirty yes <laughs> this is the dirt we need man this yeah. is the real thing yeah you know the, the, this and we need to we need to now now i'm gonna have to wash my hands <laughs> Why are you dirty? Yeah, I'm you need dirty. To wash yeah. them. <laughs> Let's jump in the lake. Yeah. <laughs> That'll cool. wake us up. So we didn't get to jump in the water, but it's an invitation for me to go back and spend some time learning more and working with him. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hug Out Hate. And we look forward to spending more time with you. Come back. We're here for you. This was an extended interview with Yaakov Darling Khan from the film I Hate You, But It's Killing Me. Director and interviewer was Lucas Benkin. Production coordination from Brian Devlin. Podcast edited by Faith Lucas. Assistant editing by Angelo Guevara Malave. Produced by Sterling Light Productions and Winter Star Productions. And distributed by Matter Collective. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate us and write a review. To dive in further, join the Hug Out Hate community by going to the website hugouthate.love or search for Hug Out Hate in your Mighty Networks app.